Hey everybody, welcome to Dental Learning Live. It's time to get down and dirty and real this episode. What I want to talk about is that scenario when things just don't go as planned. Sometimes we have a plan, this plan being an MB2, an elusive MB2. I mean, present on x-ray, present on a comb beam, no doubt. You can see the kidney bean shape and cross section, but not present in your access. Discovery problems, where is it? Um, and when we get into those discovery problems, we worry if we're removing dentin in the wrong direction. We worry if we're thinning something out or over enlarging. And we're always in this, in this era of wanting to be a minimalist, but sometimes what do you do when you can't discover? And we have all these sorts of techniques from ultrasound to, to birds to troughing and, and it just is frustrating at times because if we get a little aggressive or if we think we discover a canal and we start picking and poking and prodding and pushing, then we can separate a tip of an instrument. And so this episode's all about discovery. Like what do you do when you, you know it's there, but you can't discover it? And at times I run protocols where I'll pre-run the Genowave. And if, you're, if you've been doing the Genowave, we run it for a minute and see what happens. But this is a case where that was not good enough. So let's talk about it and see it. All right, here we go. All right, time to get started. We'll start with the tooth number here. Tooth number three should be straightforward, but let's look at it. When we look at it, when we look at it, nothing's really that jumpy, jumping out at me that's that um, eventful or, or scary. I see the root all the way up into perhaps the sinus. I see the lower border of the sinus. I see a chamber, I see perhaps some stones, and the canals look big and large. And if we advance this, let's take a look at the comb beam. And I've kind of already looked at this, obviously, but when we look at the comb beam, I'm gonna sort of freeze on a section that I'm a little bit concerned about. We know that the sinuses potentially may be a contraindication in certain scenarios, and so one of the questions is this, is this one contraindicated? So when you look at it um, really closely here, you may see that you'll see airspace kind of distal to tooth number three, but kind of mesial to tooth number three, I th see a thick membrane along here. So that's kind of comforting in the Genowave fluid dynamic space because that actually acts as a barrier for us. That's something that can absorb sound waves and sound waves are predominantly the mechanism down at this part of the tooth. And it, so it's not eventful. It's not something to be scared of. Now, that does not mean I want to instrument long in a scenario like this, but it does mean that this is a case I'm willing to do a gentle wave on. These sinuses are not concerning to me. Now, I focused on this particular route. We'll play it a little bit forward. I'm just going to line up kind of some slicing here. Um, just give me one second. All right. Well, when you look at it, this root, this MB root, is somewhat kidney bean shaped. And it thins out, so obvious MB2, right? And I want you to pay attention to that because candidly, to fast forward, you're gonna see me struggle trying to get into that. I've got a fusion at this, this cross section of the distal buckle to the palatal, okay? So those are some of the scenarios where we're like, thank goodness we have Genowave because maybe we need something more than just files or mechanical instrumentation to get into some of these spaces that are clearly existing. Um, in, the, in the slices, we can see you know, some stone formations that are there. Perhaps there's a, there's a ledge on the MB2 that we need to trough around. A little bit of asymmetry in the chamber. But all in all, when you looked at the 2D, I could see the canals. It wasn't like I thought I was gonna have a discovery problem. But along the way, that's not what I found. I found, candidly, I was gonna have a discovery problem. So, let's get this thing going. We're looking at a tooth with composite. That's good, it's gonna be an easy platform build, as far as I can tell at this point. So we're gonna start an access, just using a 330 burr. I, oftentimes, I, I, I favor more of an endo access type diamond access burr with a ball on the end. You're probably all familiar with that one. 
but this one had a 330 loaded in it, so I gave it a go. Um, instantly into the chamber, I'm kind of looking at the tissue type. I like to diagnose or at least describe my findings of the pulp tissue, so I do a diagnosis of what it is from my testing standpoint, give it a diagnosis, but I also do pulpal findings. Sometimes they don't coordinate, correlate, sometimes they're different per canals, and that's just something I've gotten in the habit of recording. Um, so this tooth did test vital, so meaning it did have a response to cold, but not really super hyperemic. Maybe it's more ischemic. So you can see some pulpal remnants here in that palatal root. And so I'm gonna just kind of go in there and see what comes out of that palatal root. And I'm just using an SX, getting a good bite. Now I'm looking at the DB, getting a good bite. So far, so good. Case seems fairly straightforward. I'm gonna pick up this stone, just flick it out. Again, I'm just using SX as a discovery, discoverer. But I've not found the MB2. So flushing out, get a better look-see inside that uh, chamber. My assistant's doing a great job. I hate it when those mirrors fog. Even with a rubber dam, sometimes that patient's breath can get through that thing and fog my mirror. So clearly MB1, distal buckle, and powdle, just easy to discover. Easy case, right? Mm -mm, not so easy. You can see that stone floating in there. Um, not coming up as easy as I thought it would, but no big deal. This is a 1506, just going inside there. Just picking at it, just wanna get it out. But one thing that I'm acknowledging at this point is there's no MB2 along that pulpal floor. And I'm just doing sort of a troughing technique, taking a Mueller burr, and I'm going to feather along the floor, going sort of more mesial, more lingual, hence ML, that terminology. And I know it's kidney bean shaped. I'm staring at the comb beam, looking at it, trying to figure out where this puppy is and why I can't get into it. I hate this part actually because I don't want to really remove more dentin if I don't have to. But I also don't want to not do my job as an endodontist and leave something behind. And I'm feeling that there's a little ledge or a little lip or some sort of dental shelf there. And so I'm trying to remove that. And just looking at that floor to see if I see any chalkiness or any element of where I can identify where the MB2 is. And honestly, I'm not finding anything. You know, sometimes I'll set goals for myself when I'm working on a case, like how much time am I gonna allot in the discovery phase? How much time am I gonna allot in an instrumentation phase? And the reason why I've learned to sort of train my mind to look at time, again, you'll see me, if you can barely see, it's a little off screen because I'm struggling right up there to try to see if I can't find that canal. But what I was saying is I'll, I'll set goals for myself and part of that is for practice management purposes and part of it is, is so I don't get frustrated where I get aggressive, where I shouldn't be aggressive. Um, if, if sometimes if you have to stop and walk do a lap around your office to come back and sit in the setting, I recommend doing that. Sometimes a fresh look at something if you get lost inside where you're not seeing a roadmap on that pulpal floor, take the opportunity to, to reset your brain to look at it with a fresh set of eyes. And what I was doing, I was kind of picking to where I thought the most mesial lingual extent of it would be, no avail. So then I thought, well, maybe if I get back to the MB and start trying to trace it, extending it along that semicolon shape, then maybe that would be a strategy to help find more anatomy, not working so well. Now I can go back and keep troughing. My mind's starting to process a decision tree. Hence, what did I do? 
went back, started feathering again. I'm doing it very slowly, not trying to be aggressive. I don't love, I hate it when I see a trough on an x-ray, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. So what are my options? I can switch up to an ultrasonic, could be a potential option. I can keep picking with an SX to see if something bites, may break a tip, but it's an option. I can try different sizes of these uh, burrs, different head sizes, might be another option. Or you can just pretend it's not there, and some guys do that. But I feel like obligated as an endodontist to never, it's like leaving my kids at a gas station. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna leave them at a gas station, I'm gonna put them in the car where they're supposed to be. And in that analogy, that's what it is. I have to find that canal or I'm not going to sleep at night. But how much time and, and when do you stop insanity when you just can't get it? But I'm a believer. If it's there, it's there. And it's just, man, I'm just not picking up any detail. So now this is the point, and I'm in it. I'm in it, in it roughly, if you look at the screen, almost 10 minutes. I'm starting to get some blood pressure problems, right? I'm starting to sweat on the back of my neck. My assistants know that I'm only using an SX, and they know that I'm looking for something. And um, now I'm starting to consider a different alternative approach. Maybe it's time to start employing the GenoWave. But if I employ the GenoWave, I got a thought process now. Do I just use a minute. I used to feel really good about the extended cycle and just hit the extended button on the gentle wave and give me an extra minute, but uh, we've increased the time allotted for vital cases. Now it's not really technically an extra minute. So that kind of put emphasis on, well, maybe I should work a little bit further. Maybe I should go a little bit longer, just traditionally feathering, lightening, trying to discover where that MB2 is. And I think it would be fantastic if I could have an, an option on the gentle wave to actually just use it only for discovery and then start the protocol at the end. Some guys might just trust the gentle wave so much they may just run it with the MB1 and hoping the fluid gets around the semicolon into the ML. <clears throat> and that may happen in some cases. But if you go back and look at my CBCT, it was a pretty long, wide space between the MB and the ML, and I was not comfortable trusting only fluid dynamics coming at it from maybe a little bit from the, the coronal aspect, but mostly from sort of a lateral aspect inside the mesial buccal canal. And that was something that I wasn't gonna risk or hang my reputation on. So I really want to find this. Plus it's my pride, like we're all prideful, right? So I'm still working. I'm still working and I'm getting past my sort of intuitive goal of eight minutes. I'm now down to 11 minutes or 12, getting close to 12 minutes. And it's not that time matters, like you do the job. I, there's an old adage that if you don't have time to do it right the first time, when are you gonna have time to do it this right the second time? So I'm a big believer in just trying to do it right the first time, regardless of the time, but I'm also conscious of the time. I'm a busy practice and I have other patients to attend to, but I cannot shortchange this. So what I've done is I said, okay, no MB2 discovered. Let's just establish my lengths. Frankly, because I know I don't have a bony buffer of, of uh, cancellous bone around that apices of these roots, certainly not the MB, which I just showed you on that pre-op comb beam. But I'm trying to understand where my lengths are vis-a-vis -vis -vis the comb beam. So I thought, okay, let me pause, let me reset my brain, let me focus on another task. Next thing I know, I'm bending my files trying to get the apex locator reading. So it's not a really smooth case to date. <laughs> Nothing's going wrong, but it's certainly not just the one, two, three, four, where you're in NASCAR crew pit where everything is just fast and, and efficient. So, okay, I got a twiddling issue in the palatal root because I already knew it had a stone and it had that remnant pulp tissue in there or calcifications in there. But now it's bending my file and giving me a little bit of havoc, but I'm nonetheless working through that. Established my length there, and now I'm going off to the distal buckle. But if you look in the lower left, I'm uh, getting a little bit frustrated and I'm grabbing a fresh instrument. Just because I know I was 
hitting those stones. So instead of bending more files, I have a reference point. I'm going back to a 1506 and there it is. It's coming up right here. You can see it along that wall. What was giving my file some havoc and now you see it on there. And, that, and that's times so we get these stenotic pulps at times. You can see it. There it is. A little bugger was bent in a 10 file. Frustrating. Kind of cool though. Just kind of upped it to a 2004. And now that I'm kind of through that, I'm just checking the other canals to see what comes up. I, I'm not really instrumenting like I did where I'm trying to clean the walls with a file that matches the girth of the, of the canal anatomy. I just really want a pathway for fluid dynamics. And so I'm focusing on that. 2004 is where I'm at now. I'm not going to my sort of working length. I'm staying short in old school endodontics. Like when I learned endodontics, you know, it was with hand files. It was pre-rotary. And we had a concept taught to me called the estimated working length. And it was sort of length minus two. That was our estimated working length. So radiographic length minus two millimeters gave me my EWL or my estimated working length. And I find myself now thinking like that again with the gentle wave. Because I know the last millimeter or two millimeters is going to be cleaned by the gentle wave and fluid solely. And I'm really adopted that. I really believe in that now. So now um, I'm instrumenting with a 2004 to that EWL or length minus two and kind of established sort of that fluid dynamics in the MB, DB, and P. But where the heck is the MB2? I might be thinking four letter words in my mind right now, but I'm not giving up. So I am starting to push a little bit harder. I'm using an SX, the old universal stiff guy, trying to get something to bite. Between feathering with that Mueller burr and this SX, I mean, my goodness, I'm 16 minutes into it and I'm not getting anywhere. So what did I decide? I got to go to the gentle wave. I've done my best, sort of doubled my allotted time. Not done with it. I'm not going to give up ever. I will not give up, but I'm not satisfied with not finding the MB2. So you saw me grab a, um, a cotton pellet saturated in isopropyl alcohol, highest proof I've got, which is 90 proof. Clean the environment, scrub the top of the tooth, get any sort of proteins off it, pellicles, um, plaque, whatever it may be. And then I'm just going to go to the sound seal. Now, when I use the sound seal, I always have now sort of gone all the way around like, like you can see around the tooth, frankly, because the, the lid of the platform is wider than the occlusal table in most circumstances, and I want a solid platform. So I go all the way around, draw it up on the occlusal table. I don't care if it gets into my access. I fill up the underside of the platform, the antaglial side, goop it up all the way to the top of the, the little nipple, and then I connect the dots and do one cure. Now, I'm used to now touching the top of that platform with my curing light and just letting, it, letting the heat work to my advantage um, in setting that up. Um, I'm really picky about this step. Nothing's more frustrating for me than having some sort of dislodgement of my platform. So I don't want any evidence of that. And so what I've learned is I'll take hemostats, not cotton pliers, because I can actually torque it. And as I'm torquing it off, if it lifts that sound seal or pushes down that sound seal and I get any sort of teeter-tottering effect going on, I know I didn't do a good platform. And I know that now. So it's just a little endo, son endo hack that I've used as feedback loop for me so that it doesn't sort of tip the occlusal table. Now, when it comes off and everything's sound and I got a good platform, now I can go reaccess. And the idea here is I don't want to enlarge my access. I just want to reaccess. Couple choices. I'm using a diamond access burr, but I'm throttling back. I have an electric motor. I could turn down or I just use my rheostat and throttle back and try to find my outline because sound seal is very, very soft. Denton's a little bit harder. So I have tactile feedback, haptic tactile feedback in if I slow down that high speed, I can acknowledge where that is. And then if I have a little void along that cable surface margin, 
then I can actually take another, I use this tip that you see, which I've modified with a sickle hook on the end, because I can get into any sort of voids that are underneath there. Now, candidly, the, the thing's not gonna leak. If I were to not do this patch and just run the sound seal, it would work. But my wall's not smooth. And when you really understand fluid dynamics and what's going on, I don't want another chamber off a chamber to affect the fluid dynamic part, which is really what's going on around that sound bar, where it's a lot of fluid dynamics and a little bit of sound, but mostly fluid dynamics as far as the efficacy, what's going on in that. But I don't, if I have a smooth wall, it kind of keeps that cavitation cloud exactly where I want it to help me generate the sort of, of negative pressure that can get developed. Um, by fluid dynamics, where you have a fast current over an empty space, hence creating sort of a lift concept or this negative pressure. And so um, I know that the smoother my walls are, the more effective it becomes. And I spent some time talking to the engineers at Sonendo, explaining that to me, and then in practice, I notice a difference. So I like smooth walls, and so I don't want to over enlarge, but if there's any sort of aberrancies in whether it's Mother Nature or uh, a cavity or just a void, I'm going to try to f true that up. And that's what I just did. Again, I'm trying to do it right the first time. And I need to discover where that darn MB2 is. So now you see me fire up the Genoive. As I was talking, I did go through a, a, the jig protocol. Some people use Perioprobe. Use what you want. My technique is I'll scratch the bottom surface with the length that's correct, where I scratch the, the bottom surface. And as, as let me re-speak what I just said. Once I scratch the bottom surface with the jig, I go one size up. Some people will go to where if they feel like the jig's barely touching, they'll go to that size. Because technically, it, when you put the cap on, it shortens the sound bar a little bit. Let's say it's a millimeter. But I don't do that. I go to one size smaller because I'm feeling like I, the way that I push hard on it, on the sound seal, I'm flickering along the floor. I'm not touching. I'm actually bending and I'm hearing an audible sound. And because of that, then I choose one sound heart, um, one, sa one cap that's a, that's a little bit shorter. And so um, that's my selection process. And I'm just trying to go into a little bit more detail on that because I've got a lot of questions about that. Now, you let the console do its magic, and you saw in that explainer video that it's going to degas the fluid, run through the procedural instrument down inside the tooth as it's getting demonstrated, filling up the tooth with fluid during that sort of zero to 100% of a degassing process. That's what reads on the console. It's a percentage at that point. And then once it kind of hits to where it's supposed to go, now it's going to start the time clock Bleach is coming through, it's sort of calibrated to be running at close to 3% and then it's going through this. Now those little lines that you see in that animation represent the sound waves actually. The advanced fluid dynamics is at top and maybe a little bit into the chronal aspect, but otherwise where fluid drops off, sound begins. And technically that sound wave is getting the, the chemistry and the sound in that apical terminus zone. And when you do that, you're seeing a demonstration of sometimes really funky anatomy. Not always, but a lot of times you are seeing it. And when I look at this, I really want a smooth experience. And what I mean by that, the thing kind of hums at you. And as, it, as it's consistent and that sound is consistent and the vibration in your fingertips of the procedural instrument remain consistent, that's what you want. And it may get a little bit boring at times, but I recommend always staying tuned in to what's going on because it's boring until it's not. And that could be that you, disc you, know, you developed a leak or perhaps there was an instrumentation problem and you instrumented long and you'll start seeing some precursor information coming through if you become a very good student of paying attention to the feedback you'll start to understand my belief is this thing always tells you the truth of what's going on inside. Um, but for the most part, it's, 
if you've done your job right and built the correct platform and didn't over instrument, it's just business as usual. Patients may audibly feel something or tactily feel something. They'll describe kind of a, a white noise or they'll describe a gentle flutter and just let that go. That's normal. The other thing that, you know, as I started diving into the fluid dynamics theories and learning more and more about it, you got to remember this thing is cleaning all canals simultaneously at the exact same time. And in that, sometimes there's little pressure gradients that can flutter around between different canals where one has a little bit more negative suction than another and then vice versa. They kind of jump around if you were to follow each canal um, individually. And when you have a two to one scenario, actually they start working in harmony and you get sort of a race track type of scenario with the fluid coming in and through those canals. And that's where it really helps you sort of when I made the comment earlier on where it works on the mesial buckle and then extends over into the mesial ingle, that's why. But if this thing is clocked up, totally clogged on the mesial lingual, now I just want to use it long enough to discover. So in this scenario, because I felt like I worked really hard, I chose, consciously chose, to run the whole cycle. And I wanted to make sure I had a good user experience. Now you saw me kind of flutter a little bit there, and that's simply because the patient was moving on me. But uh, it wasn't anything to do with the gentle wave. But now, you know, again, I'm just letting that run and I'm trying to pay attention for turbidity, puffs of pink. Um, sometimes when you have a, a tooth that's not really hemorrhagic, despite being vital, and if you go through it and you start acknowledging puffs of pink through there, that could indicate that maybe you're through one of those canals to the terminus or there's a perforation or something going on that you didn't know about or a resorption defect that you didn't know about. So pay attention to that. And if you want to exaggerate puffs of pink, if you think that's developing, puffs of pink meaning start to dry, you know, minute, two minutes into the cycle, you start seeing puffs of pink. What I'll do is I'll just throttle back my rheostat. I'll just let it up. And as I let it up, it gives, if something's bleeding from the outside environment, it kind of pools inside and then I'll start the rheostat and it kind of quickly degasses again and you'll see a red cloud. That's what I'm talking about. And I've learned to do that on some more risky cases. And I'm only speaking about that now, just taking into consideration at the beginning, I didn't have any bony cancellous bone around the terminuses of my, of my roots. They're in the sinus. I just had a buffer of, you know, mucosa Schneiderian mem membrane or mucosa that's just sort of thickened in that sinus environment. But so far so good. I'm not really discovering anything traumatic or wrong. Patient's happy. Um, smooth saline both tactily and visually. But I'm still engaged. You'll see me, you know, still engaged over here paying attention. Getting close to the end. But boy, I'm ready to jump back right in there and see if I can find and discover the MB2 or get an instrument to go. Now that's something to think about. How do you all feel about that? What do you feel like if I want to re-instrument the MB2 to a new 2004 or 2504? Would I feel different if it was two, two to one back to two or just its own separate canal that never reunited with the MB1? Or what if it was just two to one all the way to the end? How would you feel about that? So those scenarios are something that you got to consider. But all in all, you're an endodontist and you'll figure it out. And if you re-instrument it, just re-instrument it and use your normal protocol even, you, even though you ran the Geno wave. Or you could even run a second Geno wave. But those are the things, those are our options, those are the tools that we have and the theories that we have. We do what feels right or what you think is in the best case for our patients. And if you look around, I'm not really getting any splatter. My assistant's not really suctioning. I've got a really good seal. Even when my patient moved on me, nothing really, everything's uneventful, which is great. All right, so now we're getting close to the end and I, can, I know that both from the time clock but also from my assistant walking over to me. That's always the clue when she's getting towards the end. She's going to 
keep me going. So my, my protocol at this point, when I'm still discovering something, I'm going to take off that, that sound seal. I know now I see active bleeding. That's kind of from this, the, um, the hickey that I gave the tooth, so to speak. I'm using 3% hypertonic, so 3% hypertonic saline that's pre-made in a, in a saline bag, not from a pharmacy. They're different. The other, the latter, does not stay in suspension, does not work as well. And now what I'm doing is I'm sort of binding the needle a little bit and then I'm applying a little bit of positive pressure with the irrigation syringe, which is counterintuitive. You never would do that with bleach or any other chemical. And I'm just letting that soak a little bit to let the, um, the clotting formation begin as it's making the red blood cells sticky. And then I can flush that out and then begin to see if I found the MB2. So I'm using a little cannula to suction out and let's see if I can get this into better focus. You can see where I've kind of feathered and, and troughed looking for the MB2. And before I have heme filling up the back of my floor, you know, I'm, I'm noticing some, some picking points from my instrumentation. I'm not seeing active bleeding in the MB2. So I'm going to actually start feathering what I feel like is a better roadmap, better, better location, thanks to the Genowave. Wave. And uh, I'm going to look in a place I didn't look before. I think one of the things we have a tendency to do is sometimes we'll predict a spot in our mind where we believe it is and we just keep working in that spot. But if it doesn't open up, look elsewhere. And that's what I did. You could see me where I was getting heavy handed and picking, but there was clearly no heme coming through that and the Genowave wave did not open that up. And that tells me I was in the wrong spot. So as I'm feathering a little bit more lingual and a little bit more mesial, so more lingual, more mesial, that's where I'm looking now. And as I'm doing that, I'm starting to see some um, fluid come through hydration fluid come through and it's teaching me that now I'm discovering where the MB2 or the ML, whatever terminology you like, is. So for me, I'm not done yet. I didn't find the MB2 and it may be a matter of pride, but I'm going to find that puppy. And now I am seeing right there where that elusive bugger was. And sure enough, do you see that? Do you see as I'm going in there? Heme is starting to come out. And if you look really closely, you'll see the tip of that SX starting to subtly get a bite, get some entrance, and it's starting to create a pathway. And I'm feeling fantastic. 38 minutes into the case, but I've discovered where that MB2 is. I'm not super proud. The perfectionist in me, it's minimal, but I did do some troughing, but there it is right there. And now I'm to a 1506. And I am so glad I took the time to discover where that puppy was. And you know what? Truth be told, I don't know if we would have or I would have if I would have kept looking. I, pr I literally was looking in a little bit too uh, distal and I should have been more mesial and I certainly wasn't further enough lingual or palatal but there is tissue in that at least presumably there was tissue in that but I definitely see the pathway of heme so it tells me a couple things I know the general wave got to it because it created the heme pathway I didn't have heme like that in the other canals on my in initial instrumentation but I'm certainly diving into it. And it does feel pretty steep. Steep meaning it's a steep angle of entry and it does feel like it's heading into the MB1. So now I'm feeling like it's a two to one because I got through that constriction point and then it just sort of opened up as if I was entering into the previously opened MB2 or the MB1. So the MB2 bound felt like it was falling into the MB1 if I misspoke. So 
now that I'm there, um, I'm going to just quickly get that debris out and do a final rinse. Now you have a debate. Do you want to use EDTA or not? Is it sterile dentin you're leaving and is that a problem? Do I still want to remove the smear layer? Is it the same scenario as in necrotic cases? I'll let you be the judge of that. There's a lot of textbooks that explain it two different ways. And I have my own opinions on that, obviously. I wouldn't be bringing it up. But it's up for you to decide. You're in the clinical scenario right now. So I'm rinsing everything out. Again, minimal bleeding from the genoid procedure at this point. I went back to full strength hypochlorite, frankly, because I was doing more instrumentation. I'm trying to get this in focus so you can see everything. And now I'm going to do a working length. And I'm leaving the hypochlorite in there. I'm placing my cones post Genowave. Now I did not use a 2504 file in this case. I used a 1506 and a 2004. I'm using um, larger cones, frankly, because I didn't instrument to the periphery of everything, meaning I didn't gauge it or actively enlarge the natural anatomy. Those main canals were fairly large. I ended up putting a 40 can, uh, cone in that. And frankly, because Genoa removed all the content, you saw that stenotic pulp come out of that puppy. And I just put in the cones that I felt right, that kind of added up to my, my lengths. And then you see where I'm at. So definitely not instrumented to a traditional approach to things. Definitely relied upon the fluid dynamics and then fitted my cones to what the natural, as natural um, anatomy, uh, you know, allowed for. So I did 25, 25, and 40. And then that MB2, actually, I, I actually put it, I put a 25 in, and if you noticed, my lengths, that was actually short, hence I proved it was two to one. But now we dry it up, you can see where we were. You know, um, along that pulpal floor, there was still dentin, so that it wasn't like an isthmus that was sort of connected along the pulpal floor which again gave me reason and an argument, although I do believe the Genowave opened it up and I do believe the fluid dynamics got into the ML, but it also believed why I didn't want to shortchange myself and it was worthy of placing an instrument because I don't have a defined endpoint other than the protocol teaches me to have a minimal pathway for fluid dynamics to occur in. I injected my sealer I'm doing sort of a glorified continuous wave, meaning it, just, it is a little bit of a warm down pack in this technique here. And then just a little compaction. Now I'm just gonna, by the way, if you notice, I got sealer shooting up the other side, two to one. Reapply the sealer in the MB2 or the ML. Twenty five oh four, definitely short for my working length because I filled the other side up. Do another little down pack technique. This will and you can see these, you know, there's just fluid from little bit of moisture in there but nothing actively bleeding. Inject. I always do a paper point along it just to see if there's any weeping from the supporting structures entering inside the tooth. So it's just kind of custom now for me to just put another paper point in in that cycle. So it's in paper point, inject, master cone. Sear it off at the orifice or down a little bit depending on the size, down pack. It's the extent of the obturation. It's 
there was still a little bit of an attached stone. So I just flicked it out. Ejected sealer. Um, what I did on my working length, I had a 40 cone in there originally. I downsized it to a 35 because I felt like I wanted to add a little bit of extra length. So I just downsized that particular cone. Warmed up my uh, thermoplasticized heated element to inject a little bit of gutta percha in the coronal part of that uh, canal. Just backfilling each one. And you can see as I'm doing that, I'm still seeing sealer come up around things, um, which I like. want as much sealer as I can. I cannot wait for the day where we improve upon that technique to do it different. That day is coming, hopefully soon, sooner than later. Be great to not have, you know, a sealer feeler protocol where it could be one of the same or none at all. All right, final compaction. You can see me swapping instruments down here in this corner. And what I was doing is I just like to really clean up the floor. I don't want any schmutz left in the chamber after I've done all that hard work. But, you know, after all, we're we can leave sealer in there and that can affect my bonding of materials or my dentist bonding of materials depending on who's doing their coronal restoration. So I take some time just to remove and to smooth out the walls, remove any debris, maybe remnant sound seal, remnant sealer, those sorts of things. I don't want gutta percha, you know, above the orifice. I want just dentin all the way around. And once I do that with a little bit of slow speed, then I'll just take a micro brush with alcohol, finish cleaning up everything. And even if I'm bonding and I have a conditioning agent, I still do this protocol. Um, whether it's a temporary or permanent, I'm indifferent to that. Same steps, same cleanliness, same principles. And I like, you can see this little dot right there, you know, and that was, Let's see if I look at it again. Right there, that little tiny speck. Can't find it. But the reason why I'm pointing that out is that's where I really thought the MB2 was. And I was in the isthmus line of it, but that's why I couldn't get into it. So I was kind of on point, but I was still off. The, M the MB2 was very much more mesial and very much more lingual. So I cleaned that up so my dentist referring doctor can see that I took the details to clean his floor for his filling, put a sponge in his breadcrumb now so he can easily find the pulpal floor, and then um, temporary material is Copasol. All right, so there you see it. You can see the pre-op, which should have been easy, which wasn't. You can see the MB2, the two to one, MB1, MB2, broad distance away coming into it. Um, and a little bit of sealer poofs around, nothing detrimental, nothing going into periridicular, like a bomb into the periridicular structures. Conservatively shaped, it was just a 1506 and a 2004 as far as instrumentation goes. And uh, I love it. I love the fact that I struggled. Not that I loved it in the moment. I love the fact that I found the solution, that I have the tools. They have the ability to do something better and easier when I couldn't do that before because I've been doing this for over 15 years and we're always going to run into cases like that. Not everything is straightforward. Certainly, certainly, certainly gives us, gives us the opportunity and the advantages to be better than we were before. And that's what I got for you today. Hopefully you found some pearls of wisdom. If you would like to share your own pearls of wisdom, please comment and uh, 
Till the next time. Godspeed.